So having lit the first shot in the sequence, I'm now ready to move on to the following shots. And I can use all of the work that I did creating the lighting and the shading and all the overrides in that first shot and reuse it for the rest of the sequence. And this is a really good approach because it means that you're going to get great consistency visually from shot to shot. And that's actually very difficult to achieve. So I use the first shot essentially as a key shot and then the following shots will all be based on that key shot. Now, of course, each individual shot in the sequence is going to need some individual attention, but it's really important to preserve the continuity from shot to shot. So that's why I never do drastic things like changing the direction of the sunlight or changing the strength of the global illumination, etc. It's really helpful to think of it more like a live action situation where you're a cinematographer and you don't go around changing your lights from shot to shot because that's not how you approach it. So although you are going to have to do some tweaking shot to shot, maybe add a spotlight or two just to pick out important parts of the composition, it's really important to try and keep things simple. And that's also another reason why I don't like using too many lights, because once you start using a large number of lights, it becomes much harder to manage in the uh, context of a sequence when you've got many, many shots. If you've got 20 lights in your set, it gets really complicated to try and keep this continuity. So by keeping the number of lights to a minimum and making a real effort to preserve the continuity, you're going to make your life much, much easier and your sequence is going to hang together much more naturally. So with the animation for the second shot in my sequence ready to go, I'm going to go back to my original key shot and I'm going to save a published version of the lighting where I'm going to strip out all of the modeling and animation and just save the lighting and the shading and I can import this as a reference into my second shot and use it as the basis for the lighting of the rest of my sequence. So I've returned to my first shot and what I'm going to do is to save out a stripped down version of this with just the lighting and the shading which I can then reference into the remaining shots in the sequence. So in order to do this I'm going to select the folder with my animated reference files and I'm going to right click go to references and simply delete imported references. And what this is going to do is strip out all the animated models from the scene and just preserve my lighting and my shading. And now I'm going to save a version of this strip down file on disk. I'm going to call it sequence one, key shot one. And I'm obviously going to use that as a reference to import into other shots. And this way of working offers me the maximum flexibility because I've saved a specific file which is the key shot. And although this is based on shot one in the sequence, I can still make changes to shot one independently of the key shot. But if I then want to propagate changes from shot one to the key shot, I simply overwrite the key shot on disk and then all the files that then reference this key shot will be automatically updated. So with everything in place, I now need to restart Modo and start importing my animation and my lighting as references. So with Modo freshly restarted and an empty scene, I'm just going to go through and delete everything in the item list. And then I'm going to go and delete my render outputs. And I'm also going to go to the environment. Now I can't delete this environment because it's the only environment in the scene. So I'm just going to rename it to delete and that will remind me to delete it later on. And I'm now ready to start importing all my referenced files. So I'm going to go to File, Import Reference, and I'm going to start with the animation. So I'm going to look for Shot to Publish, and here it is. So I'm going to import this. And as usual, uh, when importing the animation, I'm only going to import the meshes and the camera. I'll just pause the uh, video while these come in. And with the animation successfully imported, I now need to import the lighting and the shading from my key shot. So once again, I'm going to go to File, Import Reference, and this time I'm going to go to my lighting folder, and I've got my Sequence 1 key shot here. So I'm going to bring that in, and this time I'm going to bring in the materials, the lights, and the environments, but not the meshes and the camera. Once again, I'm just going to pause the video while all this comes in.
And so the lighting and shading is now imported into the scene. And the great thing is that all of the work that I did on the key shot will have been preserved. So all my shading rates are set correctly, all my reflection rays are set correctly, my lighting is set up correctly. The only thing I'm going to need to worry about or recreate is the render settings, but that isn't going to take very long. So I now need to do a bit of tidying up in order to make sure that all the shading is pointing in the right places and that everything is set up correctly. So the first thing I'm going to do is to delete this environment, which I'd already labeled delete, um, because I've now got uh, the imported environments from my reference file. And uh, it's also worth noting that my HDR is still in there, so that's all set up correctly. And now I'm going to go to the uh, Sequence 1 Keyshot folder in my shader tree, and I'm going to remove the item mask from this, because I don't want this folder to be item masked at all. And I'll just uh, quickly rename this group to Keyshot uh, Shading. And if I expand the group, uh, you can see first of all that all my render outputs are also in there from the key shot, so that's going to make setting up my passes much quicker. The next thing I need to do is uh, basically uh, repoint my item masks to the correct spot. So this is the character, so I need to go into uh, Shot to Publish, and uh, there is my Android rigging uh, folder, and I need this group to be item masked onto this folder. So with the group selected in the shader tree, I'm going to go to the item field and I'm going to scroll down to the bottom where the folders are and I'm going to look for the Android Rigging Publish. And with that done, I now need to do the same for the set. So I'm going to select that group and uh, again, I'm going to select the item mask and scroll down and this time I'm looking for the workshop um, publish. So just give me a second while I look through this rather large list, there it is, Workshop Modeling Publish. So now everything is correctly item masked in my shader tree. Now at the moment it's not going to let me rename these two groups that have had their item masking changed. Um, so what I'm going to do is just to reorganize things, I'm going to add a new group and uh, I'm going to rename it uh, Character. And then I am going to drag that into the right place and just grab the character group and put it in there just so that everything is clearly labeled. And then I'm going to do the same down here for the uh, workshop. Just add a new group to the shader tree, drag it under the override shader, rename it to workshop, and then I'm going to drag the workshop shading in there. So these groups aren't masked at all, they're really just for uh, organizational purposes. And in theory, most of my lighting should be already set up. The only light I'm probably going to have to change is this spotlight that I was using to highlight the character's face. I can see in the viewport that the character has moved, so I'm almost certainly going to have to tweak that spotlight. But the rest of the lighting should already be uh, set correctly. So what I'm going to do now is I'm simply going to disable this spotlight, uh, and I'll look at it again later. And I'm going to unpause preview just to see how things look. Um, I'll just pause the video while preview is refreshing. And with preview refreshed, you can see that indeed all my lighting has come in exactly as it should. So the next thing I need to look at is my render setting. So I'm going to go back to the render item and just set up my global illumination to match the previous scene. So first of all, the uh, most important thing is to limit the indirect range to two meters. And uh, I'm going to increase the indirect bounces to 2, and increase the indirect rays to 256. I'm going to set my irradiance cache to be on second bounce only, and um, I'm going to set my irradiance rays to 512. And once again, I'm just going to refresh preview just to make sure that uh, everything looks as expected. And this time when I refresh preview, I can see I've got a problem. The scene is way too dark, and it appears to me as if uh, when the GI rays are terminated after two meters, they're not finding the environment. So I'm guessing this is a problem with the referencing, but it's easy enough to solve. I'm going to go to my environments and uh, I'm going to create a new environment. So I'm going to go to the item menu, create environment, and uh, I'm going to make sure that this new environment is only visible to indirect rays. And I'm going to grab my environment HDR and I'm going to instance it and then drag it into my new environment I've just created. Just drag this into here. And now hopefully when I refresh preview, everything will be back to normal.
And with preview refreshed once again, I can see that now my lighting and my GI match the original shot perfectly. However, I've got a problem with the reflections, and this relates back to this uh, referencing problem I'm having with the environments. Unfortunately, when you're working in production, you get these kinds of problems all the time, and you need to find workarounds. But once again, it's pretty easy. I'm just going to uh, create a new environment item, and I'm just going to expand it. And uh, actually, while I'm here, I'm also going to make sure it's not visible to indirect rays, and I'm going to match the intensity of my uh, original environment from the reference and then I'm going to go into this environment here which is the one that's missing and once again I'm going to instance this environment material and then drag it into the uh, new environment I've just created and uh, once again I'm going to unpause preview to see if the workaround has fixed my problem and with preview updated I can see that the reflections from my environment are now showing up so that's great I've uh, managed to work around my problem so the only thing remaining to do is just to tweak the lighting so I have a bit more light on the character's face and what I'm going to do is I'm going to re-enable the spotlight uh, that I had from the previous scene but I'm going to move it so that it uh, shines uh, more directly on the character's face so let me just pause the video while I do this so what I've done is I've set my 3D viewport to look through the uh, spotlight and uh, I've just moved it into position. So I'm just going to quickly unpause preview to see how things look. Wait a second or two for it to update. I can see straight away that the light is way too bright so I'm just going to select it here and I'm going to reduce the intensity to say 2 and that's much better. It's just really just enough to, to pick out the character's face. You can see the difference when I turn the spotlight off and uh, preview is just going to take a second to update. You can see his face is very, very dark, but I re-enable it with that intensity of two. It's just enough to help to pick him out. I don't want it to be too bright and too obvious, um, but that should be enough. So I'm going to pause preview, and another thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set my 3D viewport back to perspective, because otherwise it's very easy to accidentally move the light by tumbling the viewport. And I think now would be a really good time to do a test render just to see where we are in terms of render times. And here is my completed test frame and it's rendered in 37 minutes and 44 seconds. So very much in keeping with the render times we had in the previous shot and exactly what I'd expect. And of course, because I've managed to preserve all of the uh, setup work I did for the shading rates and the reflection rays from the previous shots by bringing in the key shot reference, it means that I don't need to go through all that process again. Everything is more or less set up as it should be. The only problem I can see is with the volumetric light, um, but that's because it was still on the uh, default low value samples, but I'm going to render that separately just like I did previously. And a great thing about this particular shot is that there's no camera move, which means I'm going to be able to save a considerable amount of render time. And to facilitate this, I'm going to split the shot into several passes. First of all, there'll be the volumetric pass, which I've already mentioned, and then I'll split the background into uh, the background elements and a separate pass for the table. The reason I'm separating the table out from the background is just to help with the depth of field effect in post, and for the background pass and the table pass, I only need to render one frame. And finally, there's the character, which will have to be rendered out as a sequence. But seeing as he's going to be isolated from the rest of the environment, our render time should be considerably faster than they were in the previous shot. Now there's one thing I should mention is the cast shadows of the character. Now luckily for me, there are no visible cast shadows from the character in this shot. But if they were, I would also have to render a pass with those cast shadows and then composite them back into the background in Nuke. So you can see how using this referencing workflow is saving me an enormous amount of time. Once the initial shot is set up, it then becomes very, very quick to set up any subsequent shots that use the same lighting. So the only thing left for me to do here in this particular shot is simply to split out the passes. So just as before, I'll render the volumetric in its own scene and uh, the character are set up as a render pass. The first thing I'm going to tackle is the volumetric and just as before I'm going to save that into its own scene and in this scene I'm going to simplify everything so that the only thing that actually renders is the volumetric scattering. So I'm going to start by disabling the global illumination. The next thing I'm going to do is to disable all the shading that was referenced in from the key shot. 
Now it's all conveniently held in this group so I'm simply going to disable that group and the job is done. Now I'm going to go to my base material and uh, zero out the diffuse and specular values so that everything is completely black. And then I need to add a render output so I'm going to go to add layer and uh, render outputs and I'm going to choose the volumetric scattering. And then I need to also disable the area light and the spotlight because I don't need them to render in the scene. Now having done all that, I'm going to update preview and uh, just see if everything looks okay. And with preview updated, I can see that the only thing visible in my scene now is my volumetric light. Um, I can see even in preview that the samples are too low, so I'm going to go to my physical sun and I'm going to increase the samples to say uh, 500 and I'm going to do a test render to see how it looks in terms of render time and in terms of overall quality. So my test render has completed in 2 minutes and 19 seconds which is great and in terms of quality it looks absolutely fine so all that remains to do with the volumetric is simply to render out the sequence. So I've now returned to the main scene for my shot and there's a couple of things I need to do before I can set up the passes. The first thing I'm going to do is to duplicate this folder of render outputs because I'm going to need an extra set of render outputs for the table. So I'm just going to rename this to render outputs table. And the other thing I need to do is to duplicate this override shader because I'm going to need a second override to go uh, over the table because once again I'm uh, doing an extra pass for the table so I'm going to call this one table override. And now I need to create a new pass group so I'm going to call it split passes. And I'm going to start with my background pass so I'm going to create a new pass and I'm going to call it BG pass. So now I'm going to turn on auto add and set up my background pass. So first of all I need these render outputs for the table to be hidden. I also need to make sure that everything involved with the character pass is hidden. I'm going to go into the character and I'm going to select the shader in the character and make it invisible to camera but I still need it to cast shadows and be visible to GI etc. And then I'm going to close the character folder and I'm going to need to do the same thing with the table. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the shader in the uh, tabletop, make it invisible to camera, and then same with the table legs, I'm just going to select that shader and make it invisible to camera. And with that done, I'm going to hit apply, I'm going to turn off auto add, and I'm going to refresh preview. And with preview refreshed, I can see that uh, my pass is set up correctly. So I'm going to go to passes and set up the second pass, and this one I'm going to call table pass. So I'm just going to close this folder and re-enable auto add. So the first thing I need to do is to ensure that the render outputs of the table are enabled. I'm going to disable the render outputs of the background. I'm going to make sure that everything involved with the character pass is disabled as well. I am going to go to my character and I'm going to make him invisible to camera. And then I am going to enable the override shader on my background. And once again, I'm going to hit apply, disable auto add, and I'm going to refresh preview. And with preview refreshed, I can see that my pass is now correctly set up. So now to create the third and final pass, I'll call it CH pass. And once again, I'm going to enable auto add. I'm going to disable the render outputs for the table and the render outputs for the background. I'm going to enable my character pass. I'm going to enable my table override and I'm also going to enable this override. Now obviously this shader is actually being overridden by this one but the reason I wanted to uh, also enable this shader was to activate the rig that I created. And uh, for the actual table reflection rays I'm simply going to reduce them by hand. There's no point in setting up a rig just to uh, modify one setting. And once again, I'm going to hit apply, disable auto add and refresh preview. And with preview refreshed, I can see that my character pass is also set up correctly. So all that's left to do now is to render it all out.